Hey, hot take for you. Things are going great. They're just swell. Everything is good. For RPGs, of course. I'm talking about for RPGs. Nothing else. <laughs> The last few years have been phenomenally good for the RPG genre, and I don't think we'll fully understand how good we have it until Amazon buys Microsoft, PlayStation, and Nintendo, and all our games are replaced with Forklift slash Wage Slave Simulator 2026. <laughs> I know it's kind of the YouTuber algorithm engagement farmer thing to be super negative about games right now, and I totally could go on a rant about any number of the big budget AAA RPGs we've been delivered that amount to nothing more than buggy open world action games. And I have, and I will continue to, but not now. The moment I start farming clicks about how Bethesda or Ubisoft or whoever is ruining RPGs is the moment I start to instill into my audience a meaningful connection between what we think of when we think of pure category ideal form RPG and whatever those companies are making where no true connection exists. The real truth of the matter paints a relatively positive picture. There are still many developers out there crafting beautiful, smart, and engaging RPG experiences even if the money men involved kick all the leads out of their own company, just ignore that. Thankfully too, a lot of these projects get the recognition they deserve. Take a game like Divinity Original Sin 2, one that I hardly ever see anyone speak poorly about. That game got all the critical and commercial acclaim it was owed and I still hear people talking about it today. There are other examples of this one I've been alluding to and several you've just seen on screen, but one I don't hear much about is In Exile Entertainment's 2020 release Wasteland 3. Wasteland 3 is a visually appealing RPG that's pretty similar to Divinity 2 in its gameplay. A bunch of the people who made Fallout worked on this, why the hell is nobody talking about it? Lots of reasons, some valid, some not, look I made a whole video about it. After the events of Wasteland 2, the Arizona Rangers are doing less than okay. The conclusion of Wasteland 2 involves the Desert Rangers pretty much setting themselves back to square one to defeat a potentially world world-ending threat in the Cochise AI. No resources, no reputation, significantly less manpower. The journey the rangers make to Colorado is ambushed by raiders, and we're left to pick up the pieces, reform the rangers, and save the ones back in Colorado by doing some warlord child recovery in exchange for supplies. After we watch this cutscene of the initial ambush, we create our characters, plural. In Wasteland 3, you operate a full party of up to six characters, all with their own inventories, skills, levels, etc. Many of these can be named companion characters or none of them can be. You begin with two, and the game gives you several neat role-playing archetypes to define the relationship between your two central characters, like punks, a father and a daughter, or two mutual tech heads. You can still create your own characters, though, and when you do, you define their starting weapon, character background, which is a list of personality traits that impact stats in the same way they do in the Outer Worlds, for example, then your character's attributes, skills, and you select your quirk which are very much like classic Fallout's traits. They're significant buffs all with downsides. I love a lot of these, but my favorite by far is Circus Freak, a trait which increases your combat speed significantly, but makes you easier to detect when sneaking because you're in a clown costume. With that, I would like to introduce you all to Ranger Nevada and Boingo the Clown, my two characters for the rest of this playthrough. Nevada's a tsundere and keeps rejecting Boingo's many flirtations. It's like he gets sprayed with water once and then you reject flowers the rest of your life, come on. Maybe one day, once they're done juggling, ha, their work responsibilities, they can settle down. This game is already getting off to a really good start presentation-wise. You may have noticed the cutscene at the beginning, which is fantastic, but this keeps going. The game has several first-person dialogue sequences where you get a full model of the person you're talking to. The character models aren't groundbreaking, there's no insane mocap or anything, but for an otherwise entirely isometric experience, it does help with immersion and establishing important characters. After this raider, in this game part of a group called the Dorseys, gets, uh, uh, I can't come up with a euphemism, gets his fucking head blown off, you're treated to the game's first decently sizable combat arena and a hit of the game's phenomenal soundtrack. The game's ambient OST was composed by Mark Morgan, the composer for Fallout 1, 2, and Planescape Torment. You'll be hearing it throughout the video, but what you're hearing now is one of the game's vocal-led tracks. Most of these are covers of existing American hymns and gospel songs, sometimes more random songs too. They're given a suitably post-apocalyptic flavor, and they remind me in a lot of ways of the soundtrack to Far Cry 5. The music isn't diegetic like in that game for the most part, but it is all very good and does sell the air as it's placed in well. Three, when there were fifty. Cold logic says I should turn you away. That there aren't enough of you left to do the job at hand. 
But that Dorsey ambush was my fault. And I owe you more than explanations and apologies. So, here's something more tangible. This is the Patriarch, the strongman dictatorial leader of Colorado Springs, which is the biggest settlement in the area. He's the man promising to help us if we find and capture his three children, Victory, Liberty, and Valor, with each child representing one of the three major acts or arms of the main story, and each of which taking you all over different parts of the snow-covered Colorado map. As I've mentioned before, in this game you control a squad of up to six, which is an interesting number. Most of the party-based RPGs I've played restrict you to four, and even those to me can sometimes feel overwhelming or drawn out. When combat is initiated, the world space transforms into a visible grid which demarcates range and movement so you can start planning your first turn. Each member of your party gets their own number of action points they can spend based on their stats, and these can be used for movement, attack, special attack moves, item usage, or they can be spent on things like evasion percentage. Turns are relatively short, so managing six combatants at once isn't in a vacuum too time consuming. You move into position, utilize and cover, and spend the remaining points taking shots at the enemy, using items or abilities if needed. Where combat becomes time consuming is when combatants make frequent use of healing items or debuffs to your squad. In both of these cases, it becomes difficult to reliably do enough damage to take anyone down, and from there, fights turn into battles of attrition, which nobody likes. These scenarios are generally few and far between, but when it's bad, it's bad. There's one specific encounter where you go up against three clones with shrink rays, shrinking reduces the damage you deal, and a seemingly infinite number of healing items, and this one fight took me like 20 minutes, it's three guys. On harder difficulties too, you do less damage, and it's harder to hit enemies, leading to frustrating turns where your rangers will do pretty much nothing if you don't have them set up optimally. This also increases the time spent in combat, and I won't lie, in both of my playthroughs whenever I got annoyed by it, I cranked the difficulty all the way down just to be done with the encounter. I get impatient easily, and personally I don't find it enjoyable or reasonable to be in combat for double the time you're spending in dialogue or exploring. That's kinda just my preference though, I can understand how it might be more fun for someone more engaged by tactics. I'm also just not good. So, critics that I've read online have pointed out that Wasteland 3's combat is not the most tactical on offer, and that is certainly true. You aren't meticulously mixing and matching elemental abilities like in Original Sin 2, nor are you forced to optimize if you don't want to, but you can and it is rewarding. Finding a specific combat niche for each of your characters and then finding unique ways to enable them in each fight is fun to me and it scratches my strategic brain a little. The thing is, I don't need hyper complicated war tactician levels of strategy to make turn based combat engaging. Thinking about positioning, combat styles, and ability or item usage for each of my rangers is more than enough for me personally. Although, as mentioned, it doesn't have as vast an array of status effects as more deep RPG combat systems, Wasteland 3 does have its fair share that can help or hinder you. Smoke grenades, poison fire, freezing, and a wide variety of different injuries your character can sustain provide a nice amount of flavor to combat. In between your squad's turn and the enemy's turn is the ally's turn, which is when any friendly AI you've picked up can do their thing. These allies are impermanent, if they die they die, and they're often animals like wild dogs or cats or mountain goats. I'm doing this for there's a pretty strong variety of weapons and playstyles to match those weapons in this game. There are some I found to be more useful than others. For example, the flamethrower is a weapon I found very little use of, whereas the sniper rifle was a weapon that I pretty much had to have to win fights. That being said, most weapon types are circumstantially viable, especially if you build your characters around those weapons. Speaking of building your character, let's talk about that. The XP system works pretty intuitively. You gain XP from combat or from skill checks or from quests, and when you level up you get to increase your skills and perks. You also get to increase your attributes, however, which separates Wasteland 3 from most other RPGs. I found that attribute selection mattered massively for any given character and then skills and unfortunately then perks at the bottom of the importance pile. The attributes in Wasteland 3 are set up such that there are no real dump stats. For melee characters, you can make the case that awareness isn't essential, and that's fair. Or for a sniper, you don't really need much in terms of speed or strength, but most characters will end up being all-rounders because these attributes are very spread out. The traditional path of making intelligence or wisdom the stat that increases your gained XP is adjusted. Now, intelligence grants you an increased number of skill points every level, but it's actually charisma which changes how fast you level up. If you max out a character's 
charisma, they gain an extra 30% XP for any action, which is huge. With these two combined, a character who wouldn't typically require charisma or intelligence in a different RPG now has a strong incentive to boost those stats. The rewards for boosting all of these attributes is massive, it's probably the most impactful piece of character building in the game. From there you get a number of skill points which can be invested into the game's many skills. Unlike the attributes, it feels like there's a push here for characters to hyper-specialize. Whenever you interact with an object in the world, the game will use the highest level party member for that specific action. What this means is that you never need to generalize. The most optimal path is to have every character hyper-specialize with no crossover so your party can have high stats and everything, but this does come with the trade-off that should you need to replace a party member, you will have a gaping hole in your repertoire. The skills themselves are pretty widespread. There's a skill for all the different weapon types, as well as skills for more specialized secondary combat methods and skills for all the major non-combat activities. Notable is that armor and weapon modding are two different stats, and speech is split into hard ass and kiss ass, the two methods of persuasion in Wasteland 3. I don't usually like it when RPGs try to make speech into several different skills because I feel like it's rare that the potential of that idea is fully executed. The reason it could be smart to split these skills up is that you could have scenarios where you get a hard ass and a kiss ass check on the same person, and then you have to actually make the decision of which response is most optimal for the person you're talking to. If the game were to do this, it would push the player out of their comfort zone of C skill, use skill, but in reality it's not used as often as it should be. More common is that a character will require a hard ass or a kiss ass check, and all that means mechanically is now you have to split your points into speech twice. For the sake of time, I'm not going to dive too deeply into every skill. I will say that armor and weapon modding is rewarding to dive into, and I found survival and stealth to be pretty underpowered. The system for stealth isn't very robust or rewarding, and I'll mention more about survival in a second. The game has an interactable world map you use to travel its many locations. The map is a little 3D, which I really like. It's nice to look at, and it makes it feel much more like an actual real-life space rather than a menu. While traveling in this map, you'll get radio broadcasts of music or calls from different people or factions. You'll also end up getting stopped by random encounters, and it's your survival skill that impacts your ability to avoid those encounters. It also increases your ability to deal with animals in combat, and aside from poison frogs, I'm doing this for animals aren't really that dangerous anyway, so yeah, survival is a certified L skill. I'm trying to broaden my appeal to the TikTok crowd, is it? Is it working? Are you? Should I play some subway surfers in the bottom so you can... Uh, uh, is that better? You travel the world map in the Kodiak, a sort of tank-like vehicle you can upgrade in a variety of ways from environmental resistance to speed, aesthetics, and weapons. If you have a fight next to your vehicle, it turns into a party member you can control, and it's awesome. Eat hot dead. The map system is definitely one of the more robust ones I've seen in an isometric RPG, if not the most robust. If there is one thing I think other games should take from Wasteland 3, it's this kind of engagement with travel. The story of Wasteland 3 does in a lot of ways revolve around the Patriarch and his philosophy of rule. If you've forgotten, the goal of Wasteland 3 is to do work for the dictator of Colorado Springs, the Patriarch, in exchange for resources the Rangers can take back to Arizona. What the Patriarch tasks us with is the retrieval of his three children, but the main struggle of the game isn't between the Rangers and the children, it's between the Rangers' ideals and their personal interests. It becomes clear quite quickly in the game that the Patriarch is a morally compromised figure, but he has something we want. Do we follow orders, or do we rebel on behalf of a wasteland that isn't even ours? Throughout the story, we're introduced to many different groups, factions, and struggles, almost always between lawful but harsh types and seemingly more ethical but unstable ways of organizing and acting in the world. Right at the beginning, after meeting the Patriarch, the first interaction you're likely to have is a mother begging you to intervene in the execution of her son, a boy who did some graffiti for the Dorsey Raiders. This one interaction sums up exactly what I'm talking about. The Marshall here are willing to execute this young kid for vandalism, which is definitely too far and definitely far from conventionally ethical. On the other hand though, not to be a devil's advocate death penalty guy, intervening in this town's laws on your first day here might not bode well for you in the future. Further, this town is heralded as one of the most stable, safe, and long-lasting settlements there is. We came here from Arizona to reap the benefits of exactly this system. The Marshall's solution is brutal, it's too far, but it certainly would deter town residents from getting involved in the gang that just killed all our friends. This struggle is a microcosm of the entire game. This choice also sets up Wasteland 3's impressive dedication to consequence. If you save the kid, you can recruit him to the ranger base, and he'll stay there for the rest of the game as a real part of your organization. Every 
every time you go back to base, you'll see him, he'll say something, and you'll be reminded of your choice to save one life instead of maintaining a, to you, unjust status quo. There are a host of moral decisions you end up having to make in Wasteland 3, and to its credit, most of them are fairly nuanced and, as mentioned, on theme. They're nuanced in that they often allow for interpretation, rarely is there a stock good or stock bad option. More common is several options, all equally quote unquote ethical, that deal their consequences based on who gets pissed off by your chosen solution. For example, there's a quest you get early in the game as soon as you load into the world map where you get two distress signals at the same time. One of these distress calls is a family being attacked by raiders, and the other is the Patriarch, commanding you to defend a caravan full of power armor from a different gang of raiders. You can only pick one, and when you do one, the other one fails. The family being attacked is obviously important to protect, they're innocent people just trying to live their lives, but the power armor in the caravan being in the hands of raiders would make situations like the family attack even easier for future raiders. There is no necessarily good or evil choice here. More importantly, this isn't a choice about ethics really at all, this is a choice about power and people's relationships to power. This isn't a trolley problem, this is testing your loyalty to the Patriarch and his interests. On their faces, the homestead issue is more ethically pressing, but the Patriarch is who we're here to make happy so you can save your people back in Arizona. This is what Wasteland 3's choices are about at their core, the theme of the game. This is something New Vegas and Fallout 1 do extremely well, and it's clear that Wasteland 3 understands it well too. A game is a lot of things, but one of them is a story, a narrative. Good stories traditionally have overarching ideas or themes, they have a thesis they're trying to drive home through their stories. For Fallout 1, it's the question of human value. After an anthropogenic apocalypse ruins the world, do we believe that humans still have value? The whole game is spent presenting different perspectives on this. With all the game's information in mind, the thesis of Fallout 1 is that human beings are destructive and flawed and have potential for all kinds of greed and violence, but there is still fundamentally hope for them. Human beings do have value, that's the moral of the story. Fallout New Vegas has a similar but much more complicated central concept. New Vegas is a game about history. Nearly all of the game's quests, from its main quest to its DLCs to its side quests and companion characters, are fundamentally about what the effect of the past has on a person or society. Should we cling to our past, or should we try to move forward? Is it possible to truthfully do that? Can we begin again, or are we doomed, like the game's main three factions, to remain haunted by the past, eternally repeating it like I am with this point I'm making right now, I've brought this up in like four different videos, he's just like me for real. One of the major things Wasteland 3 does with its writing is political commentary through humor, and uh, it doesn't even really require explanation. I'm actually partially thankful for Wasteland 3 here, they're saving me so much time. I could go on for pages about the complex political material relations of the post-nuclear Colorado we're presented with in the game, the ethics of each ending and the problems of the patriarch system, but it's hard to not notice that the very same patriarch sits on a Game of Thrones missile chair decked to the nines with the American flag. I could give you my analysis of the politics of this world, but it feels like the game has already beat me over the head with everything I might say. Look at this and tell me you don't know exactly who this character is and what he represents. You have your idea, and because the symbolism is so overwhelming, you're probably right. Colorado Springs is run by a dictatorial, strongman leader, and it's a society where some people live in tents and some people live in mansions, and the people living in mansions keep insisting that we can't let in more refugees. You know what this game is trying to say before it even pushes a punchline in. I think the satire is good in some places, and even great in others, but I wish the game trusted the intelligence of the player enough to not lay its hand so bare on the table like this. The best political, social, or philosophical commentary in any work of fiction is one the audience has to sit back and think about. My favorite example is Caesar in Fallout New Vegas. When you meet Caesar and you confront him about his faction, history, etc., he gives you what sounds like a reasonable answer. Yes, the Legion has slaves. Yes, they oppress their women and kill indiscriminately. But Caesar invokes the Hegelian dialectic. He brings up the flaws of the NCR and says that his legion is a manufactured antithesis to the NCR's thesis, and that the conflict between the two would generate a synthesis which would ultimately make a better world. That sounds smart, right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. He's a philosopher. That's not how fucking dialectics works, you stupid cuck! Except Hegel never said thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That was Fichte, and Caesar's interpretation of Hegel is so bad it's almost embarrassing. This conversation is subtle but extremely poignant commentary on how philosophy is co-opted to justify reprehensible ideologies to people who don't know any better. 
if you went through this conversation with Caesar and thought even for a second that what he was saying was at all reasonable, you are the commentary. But you wouldn't know that unless you spent considerable time thinking about it, which is why it's such good and smart satire. It requires thought, and it makes you think about it after you play it. When I stop playing Wasteland 3, I stop thinking about Wasteland 3, because it has all the right ideas but almost no tact or subtlety in the delivery of those ideas. The game does have plenty of opportunities for nuance, and in its best moments it executes that nuance well, but exceptions to the general rule are few and far between. More common is you're introduced to a faction like the Gippers, a cult which worships an AI recreation of Ronald Reagan as their god. And they also control all of the oil and they're constantly yelling about how much of a threat communists are. It is irrelevant whether one is communist. How, how communist? Communist? Okay, okay, that's enough politics. Let's talk about the other type of humor in Wasteland 3, the piss jokes. Is this Hegel? No, shut up. There's been a consistent criticism of the game that I've seen online that the humor in Wasteland 3 is bad and distracting, and it's one that I understand, but only up to a certain extent. The game is drenched in irony and puns. You literally cannot go 10 minutes without stumbling across a joke, be it in dialogue, environments, or even item descriptions. The best of these really land and actually add to the world. Early in the game, you meet a character with a Scottish accent who you can directly ask what's with the accent. And once you've killed him, let him free, or sent him to jail, you can find a tape recording of himself practicing it in front of a mirror. <coughs> the name's McTanush, and I'm for Glasgow to be. Shit, that's not it. A lick me, bobag, sod af, ye wee, cunts. Come on, buy all your heads, you get. Hey, you have a face like a scalp to hurt you, Dobar. Aye, that'll do. There are a load of examples where it relies on absurdity or puns, which I find generally inoffensive, if not personally my thing. The game has a faction called the Monster Army, and their whole deal is that they wear monster masks and Halloween monster makeup as an intimidation tactic. According to their leader, this is also done to create their own culture that they all identify with, maintaining the traditions of the past in the process. That's an interesting idea, but their leader is a massive man who talks like Dracula, named Flab the Inhaler. It's funny to me, at least a little bit, but in these instances I can understand where critics come from when they say that the comedy can be detrimental. It's kind of unfortunate because this faction provokes genuinely interesting questions. For example, if the nukes did drop and the world ended, what would the new humanity make out of our traditions in the same way we made pagan winter festivals into Christmas? But questions like those are sidelined for a joke and a silly monster faction. The Monster Army's main location does feature a really sick Monster Mash cover, I'll give them that though. At its worst, the comedy in Wasteland 3 can be described as Borderlands-like. Slapstick gore, juvenile toilet jokes like the yellow snowballs, I can get quite cringe to me in some places in a my older male family members would find this funny kind of way. Back to the main narrative of the game now. I've mentioned the Gippers, the Reagan statue faction, and this is where we find Valor Buchanan, who's the Patriarch's smartest but also weakest child. He's holed up in the Gippers' camp, and to get him out involves working with the cult, against the cult, or doing a little bit of blackmail by stealing the Reagan AI entirely and holding it ransom in exchange for Val and some oil. Once Valor is killed or captured at the Reagan AI Gipper's camp, we're tasked with capturing Victory, Valor's much more dangerous and insane brother. Before that, I want to go over the game's companions, many of whom are excellent, but very few actually have a lot of extensive content tied to them, so I'm going to rattle a few of them off rapid fire. Our first companion is Marshall Kwan, playing the role of the good cop for this story. He's kind of just a bro. He works the marshals, obviously, but he breaks rules, and he's much more sympathetic to the downtrodden than you would expect from someone on the Patriarch's payroll. Of the more Patriarch-aligned companions, he is one of the better ones. Contrasting Quan is Lucia Wesson, a young woman with very strong feelings about justice and politics, and all these kinds of things she really has no clue about. Whenever anything bad comes up about the Patriarch in-game, she'll deny it completely. He would never do that, why would you say such a slanderous thing? In a way, this works well for her character, because it sets up an arc. She starts as a zealous, naive child, and through her travels with you, she comes to understand that the world isn't so simple, right? Classic arc. 
To an extent, she does get this arc. Unlike many other companions, she has multiple quests where she is directly involved, and the turning points for those quests all involve her relying on the rangers to decide the fate of people who've done very bad things. Your response to these situations determines her viewpoints on justice, which is a big thing for her. She's my least favorite. You must believe that these oppressions and brutalities are the acts of a desperate man in desperate times. You're a stupid bitch also. I don't have any smart, rational reasoning for that. She's just annoying. Curtail. Mr. Buchanan will return to the rule of law, and Colorado will be a just land once again. Fuck you and the patriarch. Jody Bell is a ranger you have the opportunity to rescue in the very beginning of the game, and she can die in the first five minutes. If she does live though, she's really sweet and nice to have around, nothing special about her necessarily save for the fact that she's one of the companions who's an original Arizona desert ranger, which gives her some unique perspectives and interactions with other recurring characters in the series. The other desert ranger companion is Pizepi, a mutant we rescue from Victory shortly. I also like her a lot. It feels like in this game there was a strong effort to make sure that recurring characters and lore from Wasteland 1 and 2 got their due treatment and care as they deserve, and it seems like the developers fulfilled that for the most part. We meet Pizepi in Aspen, a skiing lodge where Victory and his gang of raiders have set their base up. Where Valor is squeamish and soft, and the upcoming Liberty is hard-headed and calculative, Victory is sadistically insane. His gang of raiders are cultish, grotesquely violent, and drug to the teeth. He has several of the rangers we lost in the explosion at the beginning of the game captured, and depending on the player's conduct, they can all live or all die. Victory's model is by far the most expressive one in the game, he kinda looks like Ninja. Rangers? I heard they were a bunch of little fucking chicken shits. If you're gonna play like that, you better have shockwaves to finish the job, because if that guy had shockwaves after he railed me like that from behind- Just like with Valor, you can kill him or you can arrest him, but you're also strangely enough able to recruit him into your party where he joins you as a companion for the rest of the game. He's one of the game's more genuinely funny and expressive companion characters, so if you can get this outcome, I'd recommend it actually. Other companions I found less notable were Fishlips, a raider cannibal for more chaotic characters, and Scotchmo, who's a character from Wasteland 2 and an alcoholic, that's his entire character, I love him. Rounding out the more chaotic or quote unquote evil companions is my favorite companion in Wasteland 3, Ironclad Cordite. About a third of the way into the game, we get a call from one Angela Death, a returning character from Wasteland 2, now in Colorado, making it her mission to see the Patriarch deposed. She directs us to one of the Patriarch's black sites, hoping to convince us he's a less than moral figure and more than just the ways we can observe. He has skeletons in his closet, or more specifically, mechanical exoskeletons. Ironclad Cordite is a cyborg gang leader imprisoned by the Patriarch because he knows what the Patriarch did to make Colorado Springs as safe as it is. When the Patriarch invaded the area, he provided the local gangs with supplies, weapons, and slaves in exchange for territory. Colorado Springs is safe from raiders, the Patriarch couldn't care less if the raiders kill everyone out east as long as his little slice of land is safe. Cordite knows this, where even most of the gangs themselves don't, nor does anyone in Colorado Springs. That setup easily blows any other companion out of the water. Cordite is a perfect character for this story because he and the Patriarch are near-perfect complements for one another. Cordite has a very power-centric, kind of Nietzschean belief system. The most powerful people are destined to rise up and gain power, become strong, become great and important. He's also got a shotgun mounted into his arm, he's basically Doomfist from Overwatch. And they say- I digress though, because my point here is that this is exactly what the Patriarch believes. They are both, at the end of the day, men who wish to be king. They're tyrants. So what separates them? Well, the Patriarch was born in an apocalypse bunker, tasked by his family to restore America. Cordite was born to a slave, his mother, who through her own strength and will deposed the leader of the gang she had been slave to. Her son, by prophetic decree, was then deemed destined to rise, lead, and strengthen the gang his mother had fought to control and give to him. Both of these characters feel the immense weight of prophecy and familial expectation on their shoulders. But the Patriarch was born in a pristine bunker to a rich all-American family and Cordite was born at the lowest possible point in post-nuclear society. This is some of the game's best commentary, and while most of what the game says about the Patriarch is obvious and banal, this is a seriously poignant allegory for the relationship that American presidents have with dictators in other poorer parts of the world. Liberty, compared to Valor and Victory, will be much more difficult to capture. She's far more competent than either of her brothers. She has a quite brutal and dangerous philosophy about how Colorado should be run, but she has a philosophy, unlike her coward brother Valor or her drug-addled insane brother Victory. In order to find her, we need once again to rely on Angela Death. 
I mentioned Angela before, but this scene is where she kind of gets to get up on her soapbox and tell us a little more forcefully about why the patriarch needs to be taken down and deposed, and why this is a more important cause than providing supplies to the dying rangers in Arizona. She is a true believer, an ideologue, a zealot, and she's incredibly naive. She's not really wrong, but it's clear her care for the cause outstrips her actual understanding of it, which is dangerous. Anyway, her plan directly involves Cordite, as she told you to break him out, and he is key to the path towards getting at liberty. Cordite, as a former gang warlord, is theoretically capable of turning the gang's liberty controls against her, and Cordite would then lead those gangs out to Kansas, getting away from Colorado. The Patriarch's plan, triggering gang infighting and inter-gang wars, would not actually make Colorado more safe, it would just make liberty less powerful. That being said, Angela's solution, driving all the gangs out of Colorado with a dangerous warlord, sounds kind of exactly like what the Patriarch did. The third arm of the main quest, the Capture of Liberty, is the most interesting arm by far. There are a wide range of potential paths towards the major goal, getting at liberty, as well as several choices within those paths, and then ultimately multiple choices as to what is to be done with liberty once you get to her. This is, this is exactly what I was talking about. There are two different speech checks using the two different skills that lead to two different outcomes. If you intimidate Liberty, she will yield and you can arrest her. But if you try to persuade her, you actually end up doing her bidding and you do the final quest for and with Liberty against the Patriarch. And on top of that, there's a third high level check for hacking, which makes the combat encounter with her easier if you select that path. This is the best of Wasteland 3's dialogue design. There are multiple checks that do different things, and those checks are not thoughtless. The Persuasion check opens up one of the worst endings for both Colorado and the Rangers. You should not choose it, despite it being a full 10 skill check. In any case, the confrontation with Liberty is the point of no return for the main game. After this, it's endgame. I love Marvel! I love- <laughs> I'm so dumb. There are two primary ending paths in Wasteland 3, a couple secret or hidden endings, and then a wide amount of things which affect the nuances to each ending. The biggest choice in the end, of course, is what you do with the Patriarch. Siding with the Patriarch or against him is the most widely encompassing choice that you make. In either ending, you can choose whether the Rangers stay in Colorado or go back to Arizona. If you depose the Patriarch, you can decide his fate and ask the Rangers in Arizona to come to Colorado. You can ask Angela Death to stay or let her leave. Depending on your reputation and who of the Patriarch's kids you let live, if any, the general state of affairs after your takeover is established. If you did the Liberty Quest with Cordite, you can have the gangs ransack Colorado Springs, or tell Cordite and them to leave. Or you can ransack Colorado Springs and then leave with the gangs. Each faction and companion has their own set of endings, ranging from just two, as with Scotchmo, to 11 unique endings for Lucia. This game has some of the best commitment to choice and consequence I've seen in an RPG in a long time, to say the least. This is just an overview of the endings. There are more nuances I could go into with each of these, but instead of picking apart the frankly cumbersome amount of ending slides the game has, I'll talk for a moment on the general feelings I have about what these endings mean thematically. Generally speaking, the endings where you depose the Patriarch end up worse, at least in the short term. For a start, deposing the Patriarch potentially means no supplies get sent back to Arizona, and that means the Rangers there are pretty much done for. It also means that Colorado Springs' relative stability is disrupted. Even if you do most things wrong in the Patriarch's ending, the Arizona Rangers get to keep surviving in Arizona, and the Rangers in Colorado can just jump ship while everything here goes to hell. If you do everything right, the Colorado Rangers kinda get their choice. They could head out with everything they wanted to Arizona, or they can stay in Colorado with significant new political power in Colorado to maybe do some good, and the Rangers in Arizona survive on top of that. There is of course the matter of the Patriarch, who is undeniably a shady actor, but Angela Death is too. Neither of them are truly moral. There is a best ending though, it even has an achievement unlocked for it, and it's called November Reigns. Even though in general, siding with the Patriarch does lead to better outcomes, in order to get this ending you need to side with Angela Death. But you need to do pretty much everything right. All of the Patriarch's kids need to be dead. Oil from the Reagan cult needs to be supplied to Colorado Springs. A loved reputation needs to be had with the Colorado Marshals and the rich families in town. And the Raiders need to be sent out east with Cordite. These factors, among others, enable a peaceful transition of power from the Patriarch to the Rangers, free of Raider threats. No Patriarch, no Raiders, supplies to Arizona, and the Rangers free to rebuild Colorado Springs as a new, hopefully better society. You might be wary about the game having a clear best ending, but I like it a lot, especially when juxtaposed with the other endings it has contained some of the more subtle commentary in the game. The status quo is obviously, comedically, exaggeratedly terrible, but revolutions are messy. 
In order for something like that to work, every card needs to be working in its favor. Maybe you think the Patriarch is insane, maybe you think Angela Death is an idiot, and you're right about both. The November Reigns ending requires going against the orders and ideas of both of these people. You deal with the Raiders without violence and kill the Patriarch's kids against his orders, but you also maintain favor with elements of the high society and keep the Reagan cult alive so when you do depose the Patriarch, you aren't overthrown by popular counter-revolution the week after. And you also have the material resources to ensure a relatively stable quality of life for everyone as before. It's a smart ending, it makes sense, it is coherent within the themes of the game, it is not a middle-of-the-road compromise, it is clearly leaning towards getting rid of the Patriarch, but but it doesn't revel in the fire and bullets of it all, which makes it special. This is exactly why I think this game is so worth talking about. It's really fun, I like the world, I like the atmosphere and the mechanics for the most part, but there are RPGs for which all of this is true that I have very little to say about. Much Rarer is a game that I feel like I need to talk about because people underrate or even overlook the genuinely intelligent narrative and writing it has working for it. Yes, the humor can be cringe, the politics can be heavy-handed, the combat takes too long, and the first half of the game is undeniably weaker than its second half once all the players are on the board. If you focus on that, the conclusions you might draw is that the members of In Exile who came out of the original Fallout game only tried to imitate what makes Fallout good while mostly failing to stick the landing on it, but this is actually far from the case. Outside of mods, this is the closest we've gotten to a truly classic Fallout-like experience narratively since New Vegas. It is absolutely worth playing, it's on Game Pass if you don't own it, you should play this game, and you should support In Exile. When Microsoft scooped up Bethesda, In Exile, and Obsidian, there was a lot of talk about the possibility of Obsidian making a new Fallout game, and yeah, they could do that. But if you were to tell me to choose right now whether I'd want a new Fallout game by the people who made The Outer Worlds, a game I found generally disappointing, or a new Fallout game made by... them... Well, well what I'd tell you is I think it's about time that Brian Fargo come out of exile and get his hands on the Fallout IP once again. Thank you to my backers, with a special thank you to Adam Souza, I'm a Pickle, Jack Bradley, Wasteland3Sucks, Meffle Dude, Oliver Vickman, Ryan Little, Ride, and Spritz for pledging to my Patreon at the highest tier. There's a lot that I didn't cover about this game, particularly its two DLCs, and if you don't see a video about those this year, it's probably because I put it on Patreon. It looks like I'm going to have a lot more time to work on videos this year, and I have a lot of big projects coming up, so in between those I'd like to make a little more short form content on Patreon. If you subscribe over there you can get access to those, as well as behind the scenes, your name in the credits, and you get to support me of course. Even if you don't pledge on Patreon, I appreciate you watching this video, thank you everyone.